astrophysics? Is it math or exploration? A fascinating conversation with Matt O'Dowd, host of PBS's series Space Time, racing towards you on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and today we're going to talk about the astrophysicist as explorer. And I'm happy to be joined again by Matt O'Dowd. Hi, Matt. Hey, Faith. <laughs> CUNY astrophysicist and host of the very popular PBS series Space Time. I think this is your third time back. I know. This kind of feels like my second living room now. Yeah. I'm just going to be hanging out here. Keep up the good work. Now on. <laughs> Um, all right, let's start with Space Time. If you're not one of the show's million followers, Space Time is a PBS digital studio show devoted to astrophysics, starring our guest, CUNY's own Lehman College professor, Matt O'Dowd. Are we alone? Recent amazing discoveries have given us more hope than ever that our universe is full of life. So why don't we see it? Okay, Matt, the name Space Time, it's a, it's a nifty science pun, correct? Well, it is. I didn't come up with it, I wish I could say I did. It uh, is a show about space most of the time. Um, and so my favorite science pun, yes. space time pun, I guess, is that it took a long time for us to really understand the nature uh, you know, of gravity and, and Einstein eventually came up with a theory about space. And it was about time too. Did you make really that? Terrible. Did you make that? I can't up? deliver physics jokes. No, I. Uh, it's an old one. Wait, you you speak of this as if there's a whole genre of astrophysics jokes. Is this true? Oh, they're terrible. Oh, okay. We have to devote another episode to hearing you try to deliver them. Um, all right. Well, joking aside, what uh, what is space time actually? Oh well, okay. So it is about space and about time, but um, uh, so. Einstein had this incredible realization that space and time aren't really separable. So, uh, you know, we have this sense that if it's five o'clock here, it's five o'clock everywhere in the universe. Which is, means you have to drink. Exactly. Yeah. It's always five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. Um, sort of this, there was this universal clock and also that everyone who had a ruler would measure the same lengths if they tried to do so. Uh, but Einstein realized that, that none of that is true. In fact, clocks tick at different rates depending on where you are, how fast you're moving, whether there's a gravitational field around, uh, and lengths change as well. The, the, the size of space and the, uh, the rate of clocks depends on each individual observer. And space and so time. So it's all relative. It's all relative. Hence the theory of relativity. Exactly. Is that why it's yeah, called that? Exactly. Okay. The theory of relativity. Um, and, and the two, space and time, tend to meld into each other. That's the on... part that lay people like me, I hear you say those words and I get it and I could repeat it right. to somebody, <laughs> but I can't really get it. But I think that's true also of professional physicists. I think professional physicists, they can do the math and you know they may start to have an inkling more sense, but I, w I wouldn't say that many, if any, uh, really understand what it means. Uh, you know, I, I, Thank I you for saying that. <laughs> you just changed the way I feel about not being a scientist. Yeah, this, you know, we all just get we all just get a little bit deeper. But uh, you know, what is space actually? What is time actually? I don't think anyone really knows. Human beings have been excited about the sky for as long as we've had eyes. And since the silent film era, we've been making movies about the heavens. The first film set in outer space was the French film Le Voyage dans la Lune, released in 1902. And in the past 10 years, every year, we Earthlings have released at least three and sometimes as many as 13 movies that take place in outer space. That is a lot of movies, mm -hmm. Matt. So what what is so exciting about the sky? I guess it's... You know, maybe with the exception of the depths of the ocean, the sky or, or the universe is the last frontier. It's, you know, the, the one thing that we haven't explored thoroughly. And I think if you don't know what's out there, then anything can be out there. Yeah. And that's pretty exciting. It, it's a, a place to maybe project our dreams, uh, certainly for filmmakers who want to be able to explore all sorts of crazy ideas. 
I mean, you're an astrophysicist, so I, I feel like I can ask you this question. How amazing is the sky? Uh, I still get blown away when I look up at the night sky and I can you know, see the band of the Milky Way across the sky and know it for what it is, that, that you know, it's this vast spiral galaxy of 200 billion stars. Now, in all those movies that take place in space, there are lots of fictional physicists, from Victor Bergman of Space 1999 to Amy Wong on Futurama. But our researchers could only find four fictional astrophysicists. And, and of course, please feel free to write in and tell us where we're wrong, because that is what the internet is for. But we found that the Stargate franchise has two astrophysicists, Samantha Carter and Rodney McKay. Star Trek had only one astrophysicist, Mr. Spock's father, Sarek. And of course, maybe the most famous fictional astrophysicist is Raj Kuthrapali of the Big Bang Theory. So Matt, the fictional Raj Kuthrapali, um, studies trans-Neptunian objects. Is right. that a real that thing? That sounds, it's definitely a real thing. Okay. So trans-Neptunian means uh, a, a, a body that, that exists beyond Neptune's orbit, besides comets, which tend to, to, to come into the inside of the solar system, but there's this vast ring-like cloud beyond Neptune's orbit of, of icy, dark worlds and asteroids and dwarf planets and all sorts of stuff. Ah, uh, wait, so this is assuming Neptune is the farthest out planet in our solar system, right? So that would, that would make uh, Pluto a trans-Neptunian object. Yes. As opposed to, or, or technically a dwarf planet. Okay, I, I, and where do you stand on this? Uh, I mean, for the sake of future kids, I know it was mostly kids who didn't like the, the downgrading of uh, uh, Pluto, or ex-kids like myself. Yeah, who, hurts who, me. Exactly. You know, we learned nine planets. Yeah. But future kids are going to have to learn thousands of planet names if we keep Pluto. Oh, because, interesting. Yeah. I mean, Pluto is not, you know, there are other things like Pluto at, at close to Pluto's orbit. And, and there are other worlds of similar size um, uh, there and further out. And, and the fictional Raj Kuthrapali discovered a planetary object beyond the Kuiper belt, right? right. Kuiper? Okay, so is the Kuiper belt just another Raj bad fashion choice, or is that also <laughs> a real thing? That's a good idea, actually. Kuiper belt, uh, a wearable <laughs> Kuiper belt. You can market that. Mm. All right. Uh, so no, the Kuiper belt is very real. It's, a, it's this vast ring of, really it's, it's debris left over from the formation of our solar system, the stuff that never made it to being a real planet. Raj nicknames his discovery Planet Bollywood. <laughs> um, do, do, you get, do you get naming rights on whatever you discover? Are there conventions to which you have to adhere? It depends on your field. Uh, unfortunately, in my field, I do, I do quasars and, and distant galaxies. Whoop. What's a quasar? Oh, okay. So uh, the largest black holes in the universe, so supermassive black holes, these are the things that form in the centers of galaxies, okay, you get this trickle down of material and, and other black holes raining down and this, this central giant black hole grows. And during those growth phases, uh, if the black hole is devouring gas from its surrounding galaxy, uh, that gas kind of screams into the black hole's gravitational well, heats up uh, and shines, shines uh, with, with intense heat. Uh, and you can see these things to the to the ends of the universe. You can see them shining out from the earliest times. We can't see black holes, but we can see this Exactly. This you can see their, around it? You can see their influence. You can see their energetic effect on their environment. And, uh, sorry, that's called a, qu a what? A qu quasar. Quasar, yeah. okay. And they're cool, but they tend to end up with numbers for names. Why? Well, there are countless quasars you know there are we know of hundreds of thousands of quasars and so you know we're just not that creative to come up with so many names in the show raj discovers this planetary object completely accidentally and is that how discoveries are made i mean is it tons of people looking up at the sky and waiting for something anomalous to show up uh, it used to be that well all astronomers were were amateur astronomers uh because no one, there, there was no such career. Uh, for example, uh, Uranus was discovered by William Herschel, who was a musician. 
and you know amateur astronomer and and he noticed this this moving spot on the sky i'm uh, sorry uh, who decided to name it uranus and i'm i still say uranus i'm, I'm I, sorry about that Is i've that okay? trained myself to say uranus because when i teach i, I mean just, you I, can't get the, the class the, back the, after exactly, you start yeah, out with 15 uranus. minutes of giggling all right <laughs> uh I think we I think we have the uh, Greeks to blame okay. for that particular day. Might as well. All <laughs> yeah. right. When Raj gets his allotted time at the teles to look through the huge telescope that's shared by so many institutions, is he actually looking through a lens, or is that how it works, or is it is it his turn to interpret and control the data that's yeah. coming back to yeah. Earth? Yeah. The sad fact is, it's they're trusting astrophysicists less and less with using telescopes because the telescopes are now too complicated for us. Uh, so when I was a grad student, I went to some observatories in Chile, Hawaii. It's like some of the most amazing experiences of my life going to these, still not looking through a lens in the control room, you know, look down, I mean, it's all electronic. These days more and more, it's specialized engineers and technicians who run the telescope. And quite often we, you know, we may be up at night in our offices while those observations are happening, but sometimes that's not even the case. If the observation, if we can kind of characterize the observation well enough, then the technician will do it and the data will Wait, come back. Wait, I don't understand. Characterize the observation well enough? So are you sort of assigning them? Like, what does that mean? I mean, I mean, send detailed instructions for what What are those instructions at? like? Just in my mind, they're like, turn the lens a little bit this way. That's the most important thing. Uh, exactly precisely where on the sky to look, uh, how long to point for, uh, things like what filters to use, so what, what wavelengths of light you want to observe this particular uh, object in, because that makes a huge difference in what you see. So and are, there, are there scientists all over the world, like you, who I assume do some math and some research and send these instructions or requests to some place where this telescope is? So you, you do this remotely? Yeah, often. I mean, it's a, it's a long process. You, first, you spend a long time writing a telescope proposal to, you know, to, to be uh, assessed by the time allocation committee who convenes and, and maybe chooses 10% of the proposal. So there are a whole bunch of scientists all over yeah, saying, please let process. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and once you're selected, uh, then then you give very, very detailed instructions uh, about the observations you need uh, that, that will allow you to do the science you want. And then sometime in the next six months to a year, uh, those will happen. So this is, this is oh. a particular observing mode. Sometimes you actually do apply to go to the telescope and, uh, and do it yourself. Uh, but it's all, it's all this competitive uh, process. So something does not seem fair to me. Raj Kuthrapalli sits in a dark room somewhere in Pasadena while other fictional astrophysicists like, like Sarek or Samantha Carter have these exciting lives where they get to roam the universe in much better costumes. <laughs> so in real life, is that what most of astrophysics really is? Definitely more time spent staring at the computer screen than at the telescope, unfortunately. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a bad thing. Our, our minds are out there exploring the universe, I guess, maybe is a nice way to say it. Um, mm. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, um, it, may, it may not look exciting, you know, staring at the computer screen, but... But, but it is to you. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it is our way of exploring. Is most of astrophysics math? Or is it applying math to new data? You know, it varies. Uh, I mean, I would say that uh, astroph astrophysics that's only math, you know, it, it's not really astrophysics until it's applied to data. So, but also only looking at data doesn't allow you to say much about what that data is. So I think they, they're, they're married. There are, there are really no astro, well, there are no astrophysicists who don't do a bunch of math. <laughs> uh, and there are definitely some theoretical astrophysicists who are very happy not thinking too hard about the data, uh, being constrained by reality, um, but in the end, the two have to come together. What is the difference between a physicist and an astrophysicist? 
I mean, I, you know, astrophysics is doing physics with stuff that's not the Earth. <laughs> so, so thinking about the physics of galaxies and stars and space-time and you know the 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 universe as a whole uh it's it's a hugely broad field and so it's so you know often one astrophysicist will know nothing about the work of another astrophysicist in the same way that that you know physics is hugely broad also whether you're talking about quantum mechanics or you know electrodynamics or that so many aspects of the universe in the, in the movies and TV shows we see, it seems like it's biologists and chemists who get to go to space and not the astrophysics. Oh, if only they told me that when I started studying, I thought astrophysics. Okay, so at some point I get to go on the space shuttle, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's sadly true. We, we look out there and, and, and maybe point to the things that, that other people get to visit. Why? Why don't you get to go? Well, there's not much we can do out there. The telescopes are down here. You know, they don't let us go up to the Hubble Space Telescope to peer through that lens. That's all done from the ground. But experiments in geology or biology, you know, or, or searching for, you know, extra uh, uh, terrestrial biology, that needs to, needs to be done in space. You know, so we'll, the, the first people who land on Mars will be geologists and engineers and biologists and we'll be waving from back at home. <laughs> right. So, so Spock and his dad, Sarek, get to explore the universe physically, and real astrophysicists largely do it with math and data here? Yeah. Well, again, it, uh, it, it requires the two. I mean, so you can could, you could explore the universe and travel to a black hole or to, you know, to another planet, uh, but in the end, you're... You're, you know, you're hovering above in your spaceship, collecting lights and, and other information. Um, we do the same thing. We, our exploration of the universe is very physical. We just collect that light from much further away, and and that's often where the the challenge is. The the math, the the computer modeling is trying to make sense of uh, light that has been traveling, you know, across vast cosmic distances to fall into our telescopes. But you know, we, we really are catching particles that were at those crazy astrophysical objects. Uh, and so you know, it's a physical exp exploration and a theoretical exploration because we need to then you know, build our computer models to, to uh, you know, our computer models of quasars and galaxies. But that's also like exploring. It's, it's you know, building mini universes in your computer that you can uh, that you can play with and so it does feel like exploring to you or it is exploring yeah, to you. I mean it's I think this is one of the, the most fun and most challenging things about really any science I mean you know the first thing a graduate student figures out when when beginning is that there are no answers in the back of the textbook you know there's there are there are questions yeah. uh, and there are there are paths to answering those questions but you don't know what the answer is and you don't even know if the path you're taking is going to get you there uh, and uh, so that's another type of frontier I guess. Yeah it, it seems lately even if you're just reading the news that there's an explore, explosion of new data for astrophysicists right. to explore. Is, is that because there's more tech and therefore new data? That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So you know, the, the example that we are most giddy about right now is, of course, gravitational waves. The LIGO um, observatories, which are incredible pieces of technology, uh, are now detecting ripples in the fabric of space-time from merging black holes a couple of billion light years away. Uh, and, and uh, you know, other examples like I improved uh, detector technology, so camera technology in our telescope so is allowing us to survey vast regions, indeed the whole sky, on short time scales, you know, to you know, detect all of the supernovae and all of the gravitational lenses. And uh, uh, I think we all have a sense in astronomy that doors are being flung open uh, right now uh, and we have no idea what's going to be behind them. Do you, do you ever wonder like if, if Einstein were alive now with this technology, I mean, 
Do you ever think about that? Yeah, I just got shivers when you mentioned that. It's, yeah, I mean, you know, it kind of feels like we haven't had a true Einstein in a while. Uh, mm. And so uh, it's uh, hard to imagine. But, you know, it may also be true that as science becomes more and more narrow and specialized and detailed as we, as we get deeper and deeper, that, uh, that uh, may, maybe Einstein would be in a similar position to, to the rest of us right now, uh, almost overwhelmed by the, uh, I know, the complexity of these mysteries and also the potential. Yeah, I, w I would like to know the answer to that yeah. question. I recognize that they're both fictional, of course, but there's such a huge difference between Mr. Spock's dad, the astrophysicist Sarek, and the frumpy, earthbound astrophysicist Raj Kuthrapali. <clears throat> and yet, they're both explorers in, in your mind, right? Are they? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the sense that, that I think science and astrophysics is exploration. Uh, they're, I mean, they're very different, but I have to say that, um, that Sarek is, in a way, more like many of the scientists that I know mm. versus uh, Raj Kuthrapoli. Uh, you know, so I... In what way? Well, he is, um, I know, he's vibrant, he's uh, worldly, galactic, what, what's the right expression? He's a, maybe a Renaissance Vulcan, uh, who is like the ambassador to the Federation of Planets. Uh, uh, he, he's broad and interesting um, and that these are characteristics and, and he's super cool and these are characteristics that I, I tend to appreciate in a lot of scientists that I meet. Uh, Whereas Raj is? Raj is, you know, you do meet scientists who are more like Raj but uh, I feel like he's a missed opportunity um, and you know maybe the whole Big Bang uh, series is a bit of a missed opportunity. It tends to represent these uh, scientists as misfits. Misfits, yes. Low functioning. Raj can't talk to women unless he's drunk. But there are, you know, other characters are in it. Uh, deeply socially awkward, belligerent, uh, sexually predatory. Yeah, uh, misogynistic. Yeah. Right. And 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 I, I feel like this. I mean, it's a known stereotype, but it's a, it's kind of a cheap stereotype, and it's not particularly accurate of of most, you know, high functioning STEM for professionals. And so I feel like, uh, you know, if you're so so, while there's kind of in this cultural narrative that a show like Big Bang Theory popularizes science, <coughs> it sounds like it's not exactly. It may not be doing science any favors. It may. I mean, it may bring science into to more public. Consciousness, but I don't think it inspires future scientists. I, so, so you know what comes to mind is like how cool all the CSI forensic scientists are, right? And they're yeah, gorgeous, right? and there's that cool lighting, and they're just so cool. And all these kids want to be forensic scientists. Now. Yeah, there was such a huge uptick in the number of people doing uh, forensic. Uh, right, in, and so in, in when a, when a kid sees Big Bang Theory, especially a girl, let's just say a girl sees it, there aren't. I think there's one or two female scientists on the show, and they've been more ancillary, right? Right. And yeah. they're not seeing. And, and and even the main female scientist is, uh, well, not the main one. Um, I don't remember who Sheldon's girlfriend is, but but uh, you know. Amy. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think she is what most uh, young girls want to aspire to. So, you know, when a, a kid is curious about science and and really. Uh, thinking about some of these these kind of nerdy things uh, and is thinking about pursuing a career, seeing you know, your, your dominant image of what a scientist is like is going to influence whether you decide to pursue that. And I, I it can't be what you can't see is what people you say. You can't be what you can't see, exactly. Uh, and so, you know, sure, this show shows that you can be a scientist, but it also shows you that if you are a scientist, then you're definitely not going to be you know, socially accepted. Yeah. You know, you're not going to find uh, cute dates. <laughs> do you think a lot of scientists feel the way you do about the Big Bang Theory? Most scientists I know don't love the show. <laughs> I'm afraid to say. Um, you know, I think we all feel a little stereotyped sometimes. Yeah. You have such a strong and loyal audience for space time. Do you think that maybe it's it's that adventure for 
that thirst for adventure that keeps them coming back? What do you think? Uh, who knows? Uh, we were incredibly surprised. We, we thought that we, we would do a, a show that you know, took science a little bit further, that um, you know, people have been enjoying kind of science made fun for a long time. And we thought that there was probably an audience that was ready to graduate to, you know, we, we just try to, to tell it how it really is in, in science rather than rely too much on analogy uh, and, you know, uh, and there were, it turned out there was a massive appetite for that. You know, people are smart. People are super smart, and they know when you're, they know when you're talking down to them. Uh, and so I think that's part of it. But I also think you know, the universe. It's it's so uh, so mysterious. It is you know, uh, like the, the the fundamental workings of the universe are. The, are are the fundamental workings of us. You know, we're, we're part of it and people yeah. sense that. And so, uh, you know, it kind of feels like you're learning magic when you learn how the universe works. That's a wonderful way of putting it. That makes you, that kind of makes you a magician. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah it does. Right? Thank you? you for making it so compelling. And I wish, I wish we could stretch space time to keep you here longer, but we'll just have to ask you back because Please. you are our most often repeated guest. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Be sure to check out our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page for web-only clips and to keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab or try out our new YouTube channel where you'll find lots of science and movies.